Well, I'll introduce myself. I'm Dr. Jill Kitson. I'm an emergency veterinarian in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I'm the secretary and treasurer of Hoosier Hissers Cat Club out of Fort Wayne. I've been practicing for seven years. I graduated from Purdue. I have a very special interest in feline medicine, even more with population medicine. I'm very close friends with Kevin and Sandy Cole, and I work very closely with them. They do the breeding, but I work closely with them with the health and maintaining the health of their cattery. And so these things are very, very near and dear to my heart. I'll try not to get on a soapbox on some of them, um, but some of these diseases are very important to me in terms of, as a cat association, how can we fix some of the things? And so this is very, very close. I do, I have a million references for this because I am doing research all the time trying to see what do they have now, what don't they have now. Today I'm going to talk about preventing the deadly viruses in your cattery. The four that I'm going to hit the most are going to be, oops, I don't know what I just said. Leukemia virus, I'm not going to talk about FIV because that technically shouldn't be something we see that much in our catteries. The virulent strain of Khaleesi virus because there's been a big scare about that and what do we need to do. Pan leukopenia, I'm going to switch sides. Is that okay? Yes, that would oh, sure. Good. I would prefer to talk to you guys. Pan leukopenia because this can cause a high mortality rate in your kittens and the dreaded FIP that no one wants to talk about. I want to talk about what you can expect to see when they are, if they are there. Where are they coming from? Where are those viruses? Where are you guys getting them? And how can you control them? What can you guys do in your cattery to help make them go away? Including the weaning, the disinfectants, the vaccines. And I know that vaccines right now are a hot topic on the, on the Yahoo group. And I'm going to go into those a little bit and hopefully it'll give you a little insight onto those as well. I'm going to start with leukemia virus, and I don't know, some of you may or may not have had it. I hope that you haven't for you guys' sake, just because it's so sad if you do. The thing about those guys is they can just be poor doers. A lot of times, one of the things that they have found is they can have more ulceration along their gum line. They can have some ulcers on their tongues, but not as frequently. It's more just their gums. They get a lot of gingivitis. They can have, they can be the kitties that you just can't get over that infection. They just are chronically ill. And anemia is a huge thing with these guys. You don't see fleas, but yet you have anemic cats. This is definitely something you want to look out for. And then they can be totally healthy. And those are the ones that are a big threat to your cattery because you don't know that they have it and they're infecting your kitties. Who's going to be most at risk in your catteries? Newborn kittens. In one of the studies that they've shown, kittens that were infected in those first two weeks, all of them continued to be persistently infected for the rest of their life. At two weeks to two months, that starts to drop. So only about 85% of those kittens stayed, once they were exposed to it and infected, stayed infected for the rest of their life. As we get older, it continues to drop. Four months to a year, it's down to 15%. So the kittens are becoming more resistant to it without us doing any vaccines, which is nice, because we're starting to get some resistance. And then after we hit a year, it can drop to as low as 5% for them to get infected if they get exposed to it, which is huge. This is really an important thing in terms of the vaccines. They're going to get just natural resistance. Their immune systems are going to develop, and they're going to be a lot less likely to get it. Where are they getting it? They're getting it from mom. Mom is the biggest place these guys get it. They get it from mom and in sh shelter situations, which if you guys are bringing in kittens and fostering kittens, this is really important. They're also going to get it from other kittens in the area, but they get it from mom before they're ever born if mom has it. They're going to get it from when they're nursing, when she's grooming them, using, using her litter box. That's another place because it can be shed in the feces and in the urine. Other places, if mom is sick, if the other kitties around them are sick, if they're grooming each other, during breeding, the toms and the queens, if they're around each other and they're not tested, and then anytime you have fighting, and I say mostly between toms, because most of the time the queens don't fight that much. And here's a picture of two kittens ready to attack each other <laughs> and give each other the leukemia virus. So how are we going to know if that's what we have? <coughs> and what can you guys do to help with that? I don't know how many of you guys have ever seen these, but these are the snap tests. They do the blood tests that, that can be done. 
in the SNAP test, you can have the answer within 10 minutes. And what is recommended, the AAFP guidelines, the retrovirus guidelines that's been published from recently, I think 2008, testing any cat before you bring it in, any kitten, before you bring it into your cattery. Test it immediately. See if the breeder you're going to get a kitten from can test it. Isolate that kitten for 30 to 60 days if you can. Sometimes that's not realistic. So at least for 30 days, but they recommend testing sometime between 30 and 60 days later to make sure it's still negative because of how the disease itself works, which I'm not even going to go into that because it doesn't really matter. Um, it's more just knowing that the disease can take that long to show up on a positive test. So you can have a kitten that's negative, and if you don't test it again, it could really have leukemia, and you're bringing leukemia in. So make sure you're testing them again before you introduce them to your cats. And then if you're showing and breeding so that you can maintain a negative cattery, a negative feline leukemia cattery, if you're going to shows you're, and you're not vaccinated, even if you are vaccinated, it's not 100% effective, you are running the risk of bringing this home. The cage curtains beside your kitty aren't long enough and the cat next to you has it, even though you don't know that it has it, all of a sudden you've brought leukemia home. So I highly recommend testing all of your adults in your breeding program yearly. And then you shouldn't need to test your kittens because you're testing your adults yearly. Which test is the best to use? The ELISA SNAP tests are the best. It's a simple blood test. You can get it within minutes. Some veterinarians will actually send the blood off to a lab and won't get the results back till the next day. Most of the labs, though, are still using this ELISA test. If you do get a positive, the first thing they recommend doing is, re is confirming it on an additional SNAP test. And if it remains positive, then before you get all freaked out that your cat has leukemia, there is an additional, more sensitive test that you can be sent off. It's not a routine test. It is a lot more expensive, but it is something that you can confirm a positive with. There are some saliva and tear tests out there, but it, it's not always shed in the saliva and tears. And so those tests, even though they aren't invasive and needing blood, they, I wouldn't recommend them because you're going to get a lot of false negatives. So in terms of preventing it in your cattery, again, isolate those new cats 30 to 60 days and make sure that you have two negative, cats on, two negative tests on them before you expose them to the rest of your kids. And test them all yearly to make sure that you maintain that negative cattery state. It's really nice to be able to say, I have a leukemia negative cattery. And then if they respond to you, how do you know that? I test all of my breeders yearly. And before I introduce any new cat, they've had two tests. And to be able to tell owners that, that's huge. Yes, it may be expensive initially, but in the long run, it's going to mean a lot more to people that are looking for cats. They don't want leukemia. What about the vaccine? This is a huge hot topic. It's not one of the core vaccines. And if you're testing your kitties yearly, you're doing proper isolation techniques, you probably don't need to get all of your adult cats in, get this vaccine for them. However, based on what I said earlier about the kittens up to four months, those guys are at the greatest risk for getting this leukemia virus. So it is recommended, especially if you're going to show these guys, you don't know what they're coming into contact with at the shows, using a modified live vaccine and doing it at eight weeks, 12 weeks, and then repeating it a year later, just because this is when they're most susceptible to the disease. They've actually done some studies that show that they can still have resistance from that vaccine booster that they get at a year of age that you never need to repeat it again. I've actually, a couple of my cats, I do vaccinate for leukemia. The ones that I don't show, that I know that aren't going outside, I haven't vaccinated them for. But what I will say, this is the only leukemia vaccine I would let touch my cat. It is a modified live. It's not adjuvanted. I will talk about this at the very end. Hopefully we'll have a little bit of time. But this is really important, this adjuvant here. You don't want to use that in your vaccines. You can't give the first vaccine until they're nine weeks of age. That's what it's labeled for. It does require this vet jet system. And some veterinary hospitals don't carry it. But basically, and there's a newer one than this even where it's more, and it, like this one used to make a popping sound that would scare the cats a little bit when they would give it. But it's not really an injection with a needle into the skin. They'll put it along the hip and they'll just kind of pop the end and it's a disbursement of the vaccine, instead of being in one spot in an injection, it kind of disperses it under the skin. And it's only a quarter of a mil instead of a full ml, which is a huge, huge deal. And again, it's a modified live, so you're not getting any of that adjuvant. 
Some vets aren't going to carry this, but this is the only, only leukemia vaccine that I would even want to touch my cats. I wouldn't use any of the other ones because of the scare of the sarcomas. Leukemia is pretty easy to kill, doesn't live off the host very long at all, and very just general cleaning and disinfecting in the environment is going to help. Bleach is going to be your cheapest, it's going to be your easiest to get a hold of. Using a half a, half a cup to a gallon of water, and as you'll see, this will show up over and over and over and over again in terms of your disinfectants with bleach. There's other things. In terms of leukemia, you could even use just a general Lysol disinfectant. It's going to work because leukemia is not hardy in the environment, so it is very easy to kill. You wouldn't have to use bleach in this situation. If you do have leukemia, it's going to be really important. If you have porous dishes, meaning not stainless steel, you probably aren't going to want to use them again if you're getting a vaccinated, an unvaccinated kitten into the house that hasn't, you don't want to use those same dishes on those new kittens, especially if you're getting a kitten a couple hours later. That is something I would just recommend, getting rid of those dishes. If they're stainless steel, easy to clean. Any questions about, I'm going to kind of stop after each virus and address questions you have about that virus and then general questions at the very end. Do you have any questions about leukemia in general? Quick, what was it said young adults? What's the borderline for time for young adults? They consider up to three oh. your young adult stage. Some places will say three to five, but really your young adults are that one, that two, and that three year old kitty. Okay. So if we have sturdy shelters, is that safer than obviously a cage curtain? And the cage curtain themselves are safe as long as right. they're covering the cage. And if, if they're in their sturdy shelters, the likelihood of them coming actually nose to nose, but I know some of them have the halfway up and then the screen is on the back side. So technically, if the cage behind you has an infected cat and the cage curtain isn't going and the stuff, it's not likely that they're going to get it that way, but it's, it's possible. And then if you're up in the show ring, when you have two cats side by side, it's, it's very possible that it could happen. They've actually shown that even through screens, that it can happen if you have cats getting, it's considered the friendly virus. And so if you have cats getting friendly through screens, it, it can get past that way. So if you have your downstairs windows open, if you're able to put the screen on the top and then open it from the down so the cats aren't nose to nose with what's outside, that's what, I, that's what I do at my house. One, it keeps the cats from popping the screen out. And two, it keeps my cats from nose to nose with the outside kids. Just real quick about the, the cage curtains were good. Like I use a but I always use hot water and wash it because of that problem. Mm -hmm. But I always did. But it, would regular detergent, like yeah, material, with will that kill any? With leukemia, yes. With leukemia, just mm -hmm. washing them because it isn't going to live in the environment for more than a couple of hours. Oh, okay. So for leukemia, it's a couple hours. So with leukemia, you'll be able to get rid of that pretty quickly. With some of the others, no. And we'll talk a little bit more about those but hopefully the others aren't showing up at the show halls. <laughs> but leukemia could, not because somebody, because some people just may not even realize they have a leukemia positive cat. And so it could inadvertently show up at a show hall. Anything else about leukemia? So yes. you're saying with Philook, I guess I had always heard there needs to be that mucus exchange. Right, and through, and through a screen that could Can happen. Can do it, that's mm -hmm. enough for it. Yeah. When you start saying about cage curtains, I thought, I didn't think it was airborne, but. It, but it, but it, but it could, but it could be. It could because, be airborne because if the, if a cat right behind you, I mean, it's not going to aerosolize. If it would sneeze, but if it would sneeze and the mucus would come into your cage, that is. So no, somebody that's two rows down, or it's they're Shouldn't not going to have to worry about it. It's the ones that are butted up next to each other be because if known. something sn sneezed and it sn gave a snot rocket to mm -hmm. your cage, it is. I mean, that would be a possibility. Yeah. At a Purdue seminar several years ago, they were recommending a 30 to 1 bleach solution for coronavirus killing. And, and we'll talk about that when we get to, yeah. and, and this is that half a cup to gallon is yeah. actually what they recommend. That's more like 16 to 1 then. Is, that, is it stronger now that they recommend? In any of your literature, and, and I've done, like there's a lot of different references here, and when they've talked about, and with your population medicine, what they actually are recommending to kill, to make sure that you're getting, in case you don't know exactly what's there, they're recommending the half a cup to a gallon. And we'll talk about it a little bit with the Khaleesi virus because the Khaleesi virus is an even bigger concern than some of the other ones. 
and they're recommending a half a cup to gallon. And my Khaleesi research and my FIP research and the Panluc research, and Panluc is hard to kill because Parvo is also very hardy. And so this is what they're recommending, which then you have to worry about your lungs. Yeah. And, it, yeah. and the kitty's lungs and making sure that it's very aired out and it needs 30 minutes of contact time. It's not spray it and leave, it's, it's requiring contact time. And that's one of the big things about bleaches. And some of the generic bleaches are even stronger, I find, than the Clorox bleach in terms of the smell that you're getting from them. But it can be pretty hard on the kitty's lungs. And so if you're having an actual outbreak with it, it is something you need to use. However, you're gonna have to make sure that that area is very well ventilated and aired out. Hopefully it doesn't happen in the middle of the winter, but if it does, you're gonna ne need to make sure that you're using vents, you're using purifier stuff to help get that odor out of the, out of the air.